EWTN goes on location to Sterling Heights, Michigan for the Holy Trinity Apostolate's 19th Annual Lenten Symposium. Today, Father Joseph R. Horn discusses evangelization in the year of mercy. All right, wake up. It's the hardest spot to fill is just before lunch because your mind is elsewhere. So why don't we pray the beginning of the Divine Mercy Chaplet, just that little prayer that Faustina taught us. You expired, O Jesus, but the source of life gushed forth for souls, and the ocean of mercy opened up for the whole world. O font of life, unfathomable divine mercy, envelop the whole world and empty yourself out upon us. O blood and water, which gushed forth from the heart of Jesus as a fountain of mercy for us, I trust in you. O blood and water, which gushed forth from the heart of Jesus as a fountain of mercy for us, I trust in you. O blood and water, which gushed forth from the heart of Jesus as a fountain of mercy for us, I trust in you. So I'd like to begin my talk with the experience I had. Uh, I was invited uh, to go on pilgrimage, and we attended in October of 2011 the World Apostolic Congress on Divine Mercy. It was the second Apostolic Congress on Divine Mercy, and it was very inspiring about what mercy is in relationship to evangelization, and really what mercy is for this millennium because there is no hope for humanity without it. There's no other pathway that we can um, engage to find our way back to, to the Father without Jesus, the divine mercy. So I'd like to just speak a little bit about some of the things we've learned there and tie them into evangelization. The Pope was quoted at the beginning of the Congress, he said, what will the years ahead bring us? What will man's future on earth be like? We are not given to know. However, it is certain that in addition to new progress, there will be no lack of painful experiences. But the light of divine mercy will illumine the way for the men and women of our time. He spoke those words at the canonization of St. Faustina. He's a visionary pope, isn't he? Wasn't he? Saint uh, Pope John Paul II. A visionary who was able to bring from the storehouse of the church both the old and the new. Buried in communist Poland was the spark that led to a flame that became a wildfire in the world. And that was the, the message of divine mercy that the new evangelization would also be fueled by mercy was on his heart and mind as well. The new evangelization is fueled by mercy. And uh, Bishop Cepeda did a wonderful job speaking to these three uh, moments in the gospel where we see how mercy sort of poured itself out onto individuals and healed them and strengthened them and brought them to Jesus. It wasn't a high talk. It wasn't doctrine. It wasn't a theological discourse. It was mercy that brought these individuals to Jesus. So let's talk about this a moment. Mercy has to be the fuel for the new evangelization because it's the only thing that will overcome the evils of our day. Isn't that true? There's so much that we didn't think we'd have to deal with 20 years ago. So much horror, so much terror, so much death, so much um, against life itself. And mercy is the antidote to all those troubles in the world today. So let's take a look at how mercy works. Bishop Cepeda, I said, brought up three instances in the gospel where mercy became the proof of love. Do you ever know people or meet people who they don't trust you till they have a proof that you love them? Probably your children, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, in the gospel, it's the same way, and, and, and we mentioned these earlier. Zacchaeus, you know, knowing that he was a tax collector, knowing that he was, uh, you know, on that fence, so to speak, in, in, in his country, in his Jewish faith, Zacchaeus was exactly a man that was respected. 
And he needed to see Jesus. He needed to know him. He was drawn by the allure of mercy that Jesus put out there. And so we see that he shimmies up a tree and sort of waits for Jesus to pass by. And when he passes by, what is Jesus' response? So Bishop Cepeda talked about it, so you better know. What was his, res <laughs> what was his response? Yeah, he, Jesus looks up and says, Zacchaeus, come down. I need to eat with you. I need to meet at your house. There wasn't Zacchaeus, your tax collector, and you have problems and you're a sinner. He didn't point any of that out. He said, I desire to be with you. I desire to be with you. What is that? That's mercy, isn't it? When, when, when sin is confronted by love, that's mercy. So Zacchaeus, of course, runs down and makes this huge proclamation of faith. And he says, I will give, what is it, um, half of all that I belong. I mean, it's in the Bible. I didn't have it written down in front of me. I'm sorry. <laughs> But you know, he's going to give of his own sustenance to, to anyone whom he may have defrauded. And, and he, he wants to make this sort of amends to Jesus and to follow him and to make a new life for himself. Mercy does that. Mercy is the encounter. There's no need for judgment. There's no need for uh, pointing out the sin. Jesus knew what that heart needed. It needed mercy. That's a huge part of this new evangelization. Matthew, the tax collector... Jesus just looks at him with love, right? And he says, come and follow me, Matthew. And the next scene, Matthew and Jesus and all of Matthew's sinful tax-collecting friends are eating with Jesus, right? And others are talking about it. Others are saying things about, about Matthew. And Jesus says, I want you to consider mercy. The saying, it is not sacrifice that I desire, but it is mercy. So even there in this moment where a sinner is called you know, to love and to be with Jesus, it was mercy that spoke the loudest. It was an encounter with mercy that changed his heart. It wasn't pointing out a new way. It was the love that Jesus gave him in that form of mercy that changed his heart. And then that woman caught in adultery. How powerful Jesus doesn't even speak at first. He just in silence is receiving all that is being spoken to him. And this woman is being brought to him and she's covered in sin. She's covered in, in the shame that the people are throwing at her, you know, heaping on her. And Jesus just remains silent. He doesn't speak. He doesn't try to explain it. He doesn't try to fix it. He doesn't try to judge it. What does he do? Again, he loves and he loves with mercy, right? And he, he, he speaks one word of truth. He who is without sin cast the first stone, right? So as we talk about this, as we think about this, you're the evangelizers in the new evangelization. You're the ones that are going out and speaking the word of truth to a hungry people to a world that is so consumed by itself, so consumed by um, looking inwardly, uh, so consumed by what the, the world and, and the evil one, I would say, is offering them, that they can't hear truth. They've not heard love in a long time, and they certainly haven't experienced mercy. So you and I, we need to be those missionaries of mercy in this new evangelization. That's, that's the hope that's the only thing that's going to fix this world. That's the only thing that's going to grow the church, right? Is mercy and expressing it uh, among ourselves. And do you remember your first encounter with the merciful Jesus? Do you remember in your own life when you encountered the mercy of Jesus? Uh, let me start with the, the, the one where it wasn't a merciful encounter, and then I'll tell you the one that was, okay? When I was preparing, and I've said this to some of my parishioners and in other places, when I was preparing for confession before my first communion, and what are we, about seven years old, right? Maybe, maybe eight, I think I was seven. Um, I remember the deacon was, was pretty rough. Um, sorry, deacon, it wasn't anyone, yeah. <laughs> you are a good deacon. This one was a tough deacon. <laughs> 
He had stiletto elbows, and if you didn't kneel right or genuflect right, you'd get this elbow in the shoulder, and it just went right through to the other shoulder. It felt so painful. It's like, ugh. So, you know, I was scared for my first communion to do it right. I didn't have any idea about mercy or any idea about encountering Jesus. It was just doing it right. That was what was going to be important. So the day came for our first confession. And so I walk into the church with all my other classmates. And remember back then, you dressed up for every single sacrament. So I had my, be I had my awesome blue, powder blue leisure suit on. <laughs> that was the 70s, right? And, uh, and everyone else was dressed up. And so I remember waiting in line to go to confession. And the girl in front of me was in there for a very short time. And then the door burst open. And she ran out, crying, crying. And my eyes got huge. My eyes just, what to expect, right? So I go into the confessional and I kneel down. And as I'm kneeling in the confessional, the father, the priest, pushes back that little window and the light comes through. And he says, yes, son, what are your sins? And at that time I realized something, that I was kneeling in water. And I... So I, I just said what I, I said, Father. I said, Father, it's wet in here. Why is it wet in here? And he, he at first was curious. He said, what are you talking about? What do you mean? I said, I'm kneeling in water. Why is it wet in here? He goes, what? Are you making fun? I go, no, Father, it's dark and wet in here. What? And he goes, get out, get out. And he shouted at me. And I, I ran out crying like the girl ahead of me. And of course she had wet her pants, that was the problem. Because she was scared. And of course I walk out and I'm totally horrified because my powder blue leisure suit has, has two navy blue knees, you know. So that was not a very good encounter with Mercy, was it? So it was years and years and years, I'm talking about until I was about 18, 19 years old, that I ever went back to the confessional. Isn't that terrible? <laughs> Serious. Because I was horrified. I was absolutely horrified. But I remember in those teen years, you don't do everything right, and you still have a fairly good conscience. You still want to please your parents and the Lord. And I had done some stupid things and I just couldn't bear carrying them around anymore. So I was going to brave going to confession. I was going to brave, you know, trying it another time to see if it would work. And so this is just before Easter. And so I'm trying to find the priest before Mass to ask him, you know, can we go to confession? And I was thinking, like, later, like, I'll make an appointment, you know. So... The priest was in the back of the church, and I walked up to him and I said, Father, I, I'm feeling horrible. I really would like to go to confession. And before I could say later, he goes, okay, let's go behind the pole here. And, <laughs> and I go, will you be looking at me? You know, because I need to be hiding. I need to be away from you, you know. I, we need a barrier. And he said, no, right here, right here. I have time right now. Let's go. And I just, my eyes were horrified. But then as I began the confession, I kept seeing this face of love, right? I kept seeing mercy in his eyes. It was beautiful, and it washed away like 17 years of sin and woundedness. It was my first encounter with mercy. I'd waited too long, right? So it was just amazing to look at Jesus in his face and be forgiven. I'll never forget it, and I, I've never been afraid to go again. It, it's always been an encounter with mercy. But see, the world doesn't know that. I, I'm a pastor. I've got uh, two parish sites, and I've got about four, what, what we used to be four actual parishes. And we have many, many people walking around with wounds, wounds, because they're afraid of confession because they don't know the true meaning of mercy and what that confessional does. And see, Pope Francis has asked that this year of mercy, that the center of it be the, 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 the reconciliation room. He's asked that penance, the sacrament of penance, be the place that takes up the center of the year of mercy, that we need to reestablish that as the tri tribunal of mercy, right?
So how important it is that we, we offer that as a people and as a people who aren't afraid of this sacrament because it is the height, it's the summit, right, of, our, of that forgiveness, that mercy that Jesus pours out on us. We can find Jesus in the confessional. So it was very powerful to experience mercy for the first time. And it's something that the new evangelization is going to have to bring forward to the world. If you're a missionary of evangelization, you are a missionary of mercy. You need to go out with that mercy tucked under your arm. You need to know that Jesus has forgiven you and loved you. Right? And that there's nothing that you could do. And when people ask you, but don't you feel guilty? No, Jesus forgave me. You know, guilt brings you to the confessional. It doesn't stay with you. Did you know that? We don't hang on to guilt, people, though Catholics like to, right? <laughs> no, we have to let it go. Because, see, then it if you don't, it leads to shame, and that's what Satan uses, right? Satan likes to use shame to identify you with your sin, right? And so you need to not hang on to guilt, but to let it go into Jesus, so he can tell you your identity, who you really are. Because Satan, he can't tell you who you are. He'll only offer you a counterfeit. He'll only offer you something false and something that will not fulfill. So please, if you're not set with um, the confessional, if you're not comfortable with it, I ask you, please, engage the sacrament of reconciliation. Engage the sacrament of penance. This is, this is the place of mercy. It's the starting point. It's the fuel for evangelization. So going on, in this World Congress, this World Apostolic Congress of Divine Mercy, it was like the world was trying to understand what John Paul II started at the beginning of this new millennium. It's like he did this wonderful thing and, and now we're trying to understand it. We're trying to engage it and, 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 and buy into it. So John Paul II, he says, mercy is the power that puts a limit to evil in history. Mercy is the power that puts a limit to evil in history. You know where he shared this at? He shared this in his book called Memory and Identity, where he spoke out for the first time about those moments immediately following his, um, the assassination attempt on his life and being gravely injured. He speaks to that moment where mercy was covering him, where, where mercy was what was saving him in this most terrible and grave time in his life. How beautiful. Mercy is the power that puts a limit to evil in history. So there are four things that became evident at this Congress. Humanity will not know peace until it turns with trust to mercy. And that's, of course, from Faustina's diary. Uh, 300 was the paragraph. Also, humanity will not know itself until it turns to mercy. Thirdly, humanity will not be fulfilled until it turns to mercy. Lastly, mercy is the recovery of lost hope. You know, I think of my, my second reconciliation. That was a great recovery of lost hope. That was a complete 180. It was, you know, completely free gratis. It was gift from the Father. And it was hope being restored. So it's evident that the new evangelization will only succeed with the allure of mercy in our hearts where you and I are given to know with this mercy personally and to share it with humanity because otherwise they won't know it. No one else is preaching it. No one else is giving it away, right? Am I right? I don't hear it on the news, do you? How do your stories of mercy being publicized in our papers? Rarely. So we are these messengers of mercy that are going to allure people to Jesus again through that merciful love. So knowing peace, knowing peace, God knows and wants us to be personally involved in our lives. He already knows us, but he wants us to be personally involved in our lives. The only way we're going to have peace is to be involved. Uh, Bishop Cepeda, again, mentioned that one of the five points or characteristics of the new evangelization is that it's personal that you have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ, that you come to know him in that way. And it's, it's, 
it's not a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? This is not a uh, construct. It's a relationship. And it, it begins every day, right? It's sustained every day. And it's, 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 it's live. It's, 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 it's now. It's real time. It's a relationship. And it keeps going throughout your day. So we need to make sure that, that no, if we're going to know peace, we have to have this relationship with Jesus, a personal relationship with Jesus established. You know, I used to think that God was my automatic dispenser of things that I needed. He was my Pez dispenser. <laughs> I would say a certain amount of prayers, and I could pop the head, and out would come my Pez candy, right? That is a child's view of prayer, isn't it? As a child, we are adult children of God the Father. We need to realize that it's more than that. It's a relationship. And it's an exchange. I ask for something and he can tell me yes. He can tell me no. He can tell me maybe. Right? So you and I, this relationship, when it becomes personal, our prayer changes. And so I remember when I was a young man, I was, uh, I won't go through the whole story because it's a bit lengthy, but my friend had cancer and, and I wanted to help her and all my, all my prayers weren't being answered. She wasn't getting better. But she went and, in, and went to a prayer group and encountered Jesus at this prayer group. She encountered the living Christ and she came back all happy. And I realized that like my prayers didn't make her happy. It was, it was these people who introduced her to Jesus. It wasn't my work and me, 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 right? It was Jesus who did it. And so she invited me to go experience what she experienced. And I resisted. Because I was, I was really happy with my small little prayer life, you know. It was very convenient, and I could do what I want with it. I wasn't being told what to do, you know what I'm saying? I'm very happy with it. But, you know, when a friend asks you to go and they have cancer, you can't say no too many times, can you? So I went to her little prayer group, and at first I was, I was happy. But I, I saw something that I thought was, like, strange. And I actually, when I was younger, I, I said, this is a cult, you know. She was being prayed, people were being prayed over, and they were falling down. Yeah, and I was like, oh, that's wrong. That doesn't belong in the Catholic Church, you know. But uh, she would ask me uh, over weeks and months, you know, do you want to get prayed over? Do you want to get prayed over? I go like that? No. That's fine. I'm happy with my little prayer life, you know. But again, how do you say no to someone with cancer? You just, you have to give up once in a while and say, okay. But I, I, I was kind of resistant and she says, how about you go get prayed over? You just, you won't, you won't regret it. And I said, my, uh, my friend's name is Elizabeth. I said, Elizabeth, I'm sick of hearing it. I want you to just leave me alone. Where's the bathroom? You know, and she goes, it's up there. Well, I go up there and I'm not in the bathroom line. There's no bathroom, but I'm in the line for prayer, you know. <laughs> See, so young men need to be tricked into prayer, I guess. So I go uh, to be prayed over. And I didn't know what, to, I didn't know what it was going to happen because I already thought this was a cult, you know, so I don't know. I'm kind of scared and I'm thinking, what do you ask for? Something safe, something safe, something safe. What's safe? Oh, I want to know Jesus better. That's safe. I want to know Jesus better. You guys, that's not safe. It's not safe. Knowing Jesus better is never safe. Anything but safe, right? So I go to get prayed over and... Uh, the man that had greeted me the first time I came to the prayer group who was just, you know, do you know people who give eternal hugs? They just won't let go of you. Oh, Joe. I didn't even know this man. He gave me this big eternal hug the first time I met him. Well, this is the guy that's going to pray over me now. And so he goes, Joe, what do you want the Lord to do for you? And I'm like, safe. I want to know Jesus better, you know. So he reaches his hand over to touch me. Now, remember, I'm a skeptic. I don't believe in this stuff. Everything disappeared, guys. I don't know how to explain it. I just had to be honest with you. Every, the walls disappeared. The ceiling disappeared. The floor disappeared. Everything was gone. And I felt like I was standing in light. And as I was standing there, I could feel this warm breeze coming and, and hitting me. And it was light, too. It was like, I can't even describe it. It was light and like a breeze, and it was warmth. And it was, I looked up, and it was Jesus. And Jesus was in front of me. And I didn't know at the time what divine mercy was. I didn't know the image of divine mercy. But that's what was standing in front of me, was the image of divine mercy. And out of his chest came these warm rays of light and wind and warmth. And when they hit me, I looked at myself and I was, I was just covered in black tar, which for me I think represented my, like my sin, 
my woundedness, you know, my, my, my frail humanity. And as his warm light and love hit, the, hit me, it melted all that off of me. It just, everything came off of me. And then his light went passing through me to the other side. And this moment with Jesus, I felt like it lasted 30 seconds. It was the most blissful, awesome 30 seconds of my life. I can close my eyes and I can be there in a heartbeat. It's just, it never diminishes. But then after 30 seconds, I open my eyes, you know. And guess where I'm at? I'm on the floor. I'm on the floor and I don't know what happened. And my hair was soaked. With, 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 and my eyes were, I was crying. The, the, the floor, the carpet under my head was soaked with tears. And it's dark in the church. And I remember going down, it was light. And so I'm calling out the last person I saw, George, George, where are you? And what happened? And George goes, oh, finally. He goes, you've been down for 40 minutes, crying on the floor. And I go, 40 minutes, what happened? He goes, let's go to Big Boy and talk about it. <laughs> my experience, my experience, uh, my encounter with the personal Jesus Christ, right? This one who wants to know me was amazing. And I, I don't want to go back to... Um, a small prayer life. I don't want to limit my God anymore. And I still pray my rosary. I still pray my devotions. But, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm an adult now. And I relate to Jesus and his mercy. I relate with him. My thoughts, my feelings, my desires. You know, that becomes the substance of our prayer together. I'm not even halfway through my talk and I think I'm almost done. How much time do we have? What? Okay. Throw cabbage at me when it's time for lunch. So you and I need to know peace by knowing the personal Jesus Christ, the relationship that he wants to establish with you. Also, I found that um, in this conference, they spoke about knowing self, right? Like, we will not know ourselves unless we know mercy. I've been a spiritual director for about four years and I've been trained over the last four years so it's been about eight years and the one thing I've come to know is that we do not know ourselves. I can ask this one question and people don't know how to answer it. What is your basic identity? What is your basic identity? You are sons and daughters of God the Father. And let's make it clear, you're beloved sons of God the Father, right? That's your basic identity. And, and there's only one person who's going to keep trying to change that and ruin that for you. He's the evil one. And you have to know his, his plan. You have to know, you know that he's out there to make you not believe that. So you'll be fed lies. You'll be fed all kinds of things that will, 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 will try to distract you from knowing yourself. So we're going to evangelize in this era, this, this, this era, we have to know ourselves. We have to know who we are, beloved sons of, and daughters of God the Father. It's beautiful, isn't it? Jesus came to give you that relationship with the Father. We're in Lent now. We're in this time where we're going to, go, we're going to start Palm Sunday pretty soon, aren't we? We're in that time where we're going, to, we're going to follow Jesus in his passion, death, and resurrection. You know, the whole time that Jesus is going through his passion, he is revealing the Father's love. Did you know that? He's showing you the Father. The Father never leaves Jesus on the way to the cross. But you have to look for it. You have to find it. But how beautiful. Jesus only, he wants to reveal the Father to you so that you can know your dad. Right? You can know your Father. That's what's important. So, if we do not know ourselves, then it's easy for Satan to lie to us and to give us a different identity. So we need to know who we are. Children of God, sons and daughters. But also, as beloved sons and daughters, if we don't know that that's who we are, Satan will try and change our mission. Right? It's easy for him to tell you what you're supposed to do if you don't know who you are. So your mission, right, is to be merciful sons and daughters of God the Father, to take on God's personality, to take on Jesus' personality. That's what Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is, right? The, from the Beatitudes on, the, those three chapters, it's the whole Christian life. In one little three-chapter segment, this is who we are to be. And if we want to know ourselves as children of God, sons and daughters, we also have to know what our mission is. That is to love the world to be missionaries of mercy.
And your mission can be summed up like this. I think it's easy. I've heard Robert Barron, uh, Bishop Robert Barron say it now. He says we are to be conduits, just, just conduits of God's divine love and mercy. That's pretty easy. You, how hard is it to be a pipe? How hard, is a pipe? how hard does a pipe work? A pipe just sits there, doesn't it? And in comes the water and out goes the water. Well, you're like that. Is that hard to be a, a conduit of divine mercy? You just let Jesus put it in you and go out of you, right? There's not a lot of hard work to being an evangelist. Seriously, you let Jesus do it for you. You let Jesus and your Father lead you. That's your mission. And again, the world will not be fulfilled unless it knows divine mercy. Jesus sees what he created in you. I, we would weep if we saw ourselves as Jesus sees us. I want, to, I want, you, I want you to know this. Um, how many of you have heard Revelation, read the book of Revelation? Anyone? What are the streets made of? All right. Now, why do you think they're made of gold? Why, why do you think? Uh, big deal. I mean, you're in heaven. Who cares about gold, right? Why are they made of gold? Why did John say that? Because you can't possibly imagine your value. Only gold is good enough to be beneath your feet for eternity. Do you understand this? Only gold is good enough to be beneath the children of God for eternity. See, this is your value. It's so important to remember who you are. God knows what he created. Jesus knows what he created. And he loves you. And that creation, that knowing that leads to your fulfillment. And again, I said this, the evil one wants to deceive you. He's the accuser, he's the liar, he wants to deceive you. So be aware of that, all right? Don't let him rob you of your great worth. What was lost in the fall is restored by mercy. And then lastly, I'm running through this because I see, are you telling me it's time? Yeah. I like you. You're okay. <laughs> I didn't know how to prepare for this day. I just put everything together, you know. It's my first time at this. This symposium. So the last thing I want to say is the recovery of lost hope. The world will not know peace until it turns to my mercy. Put another way, the only future for humanity is mercy, right? The only future we have is to be merciful. So we have to teach the world what mercy is once again. So if you can't look at the Zacchaeuses of the world, the, the women caught in adultery of the world, if you can't look at the Matthew tax collectors of the world and love them like Jesus, then we have a little bit of mercy work to do, don't we? If we don't have the heart of Jesus looking at the world like Jesus looked at it, we have to start transforming our hearts and minds. Otherwise, they won't know Jesus' mercy if you're not showing it, you know? So you and I, we have a lot of work to do. It's not easy, but it's so blessed, isn't it? Who here has worked with Jesus, loved Jesus, been a servant of Jesus, and not been blessed? Right? How many of you have a, one complaint doing God's work? I don't. It's a wonderful life, isn't it? To be in his kingdom and to bring others to it. So I'll end with that. Let me just say this to, from the closing segment of, of the Congress on Divine Mercy. This is from Cardinal Schoenborn. You know who he is? Cardinal Schoenborn, he's the Bishop of Vienna. Only merciful love is credible, and without it, one cannot tell the truth about God without betraying him. In this way, every disposition of the church would pass through the demanding filter of, merciful, of a merciful attitude. So our filter has to be mercy. Our, every attitude has to go through mercy so we make sure that the world sees mercy. Becoming ever more perfect in my mercy would always be the church's goal. The encounter with the God of mercy becomes our mission. The encounter with the merciful Jesus converts the hearts and makes them missionary in their turn. And by focusing on these encounters, the per pastoral care of the church can be transformed. That's to say, it is mercy that encourages us to journey with people far away from the church, the new evangelization. It is mercy that encourages us on that journey and those who, who perhaps are afraid of God and of the church. So that's your, that's your, those are your walking papers. Discover more deeply mercy in your life. Remember the moment you, you found mercy in Jesus. Remember how you felt 
and give that away. Show that to others. The only way you can hang on to that feeling is to give it away. The only way you can hang on to that moment is to give it away. Because then God will fill you again and again and again. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Amen. EWTN On Location will return after this brief message. Welcome back to EWTN On Location as we return to the Holy Trinity Apostles' 19th Annual Lenten Symposium from Sterling Heights, Michigan. Now we have an open forum of questions between the audience and our conference speakers. All right, our first question. And if anybody else in our panel wants to answer, feel free to go ahead. Um, this is for Father Gallagher. Somebody wanted to know, you speak of allowing others to pray over you like you once were. This person says they're skeptical. How do we know whom to trust? What if a person could accidentally release evil spirits as opposed to the ones that are good? What kind of advice? Uh, it's not it was Father Greg that did? Yeah. Okay, I, could, oh. I couldn't read the writing. Sorry, Father. Okay, this is a common question. Um, should we be praying over people? Is it possible that we may release evil spirits instead of God's blessing upon them? You can only receive an evil spirit if you open yourself up to it. Okay, so if you don't open yourself up to it, you may get a headache from it, but that which is in you is greater than that which is in the world, the devil. So remember Jesus said, never be afraid. In fact, fear many times is caused by a spirit, or a spirit can exasperate fear. If you open yourself up to fear, a spirit of fear can take hold of that and, and cause you to operate in fear, which means you're operating under the power of the enemy. So it's okay to pray over people. You don't have to be afraid because he who's in you is greater than he who's in the world. I've had a person, I mean, you're rubbing elbows with people who are Satanists all the time. You just don't know it. They don't tell you who they are. And yet you don't come down with some terrible debilitation. And so Jesus gave the command they will lay hands upon the sick, and they will be healed. So if Jesus commands it, I don't see any exception to the, to the case. I mean, there are some um, the teachings that go with that, but by and large, the people you should be praying with are your family members, your spouse, those whom God brings to you. So have no fear to do that. Okay? All right, thank you so much for the answer. Did anybody else want to comment on that, or are we good? Okay. Uh, Father Landry, this question is for you. Pope Francis once famously said, Who am I to judge? Yet two of the spiritual works of mercy are to instruct the ignorant and admonish the sinners. This person wants to know, how can they do this without, quote, being judgmental? Very good question. The first thing is the larger context of what Pope Francis was saying on the plane when the journalist asked him coming back from, um, from World Youth Day in 2013. He was talking about a specific case in which somebody had converted, and if the Lord had forgiven him, how were we not going to forgive? That was the first thing that he was saying with regard to it. With regard to the larger question about judging, the, we can never know somebody's motivation or intentionality. Jesus has given us the criteria in the gospel to be able to determine actions that are right and wrong, but we can never see on the one side that the person isn't doing it out of vanity, even if they're doing something good. And we also can't see, for example, if somebody is very promiscuous, that maybe one of the reasons were that they were abused when they were a child, and they're trying to get a different ending to that horrible experience. So the reason why we can't judge and only God can judge is we can never see the whole action. We're able to pronounce that a particular action is um, is grave matter, is the way moral theologians would describe something seriously wrong or seriously good, but we can't know the motivation, which is why we leave the judging there to God. I think the larger point, which is important for Catholics to be able to understand with regard to why that phrase of Pope Francis 
is so resonant as the classic phrase is because so many in the world, especially those who are nine toes outside of the church and one toe still on the inside, is they think that the church judges them all the time. That rather than loving them first, we're wagging a finger at them first. And it's not necessarily that it's come from the popes or from priests or from women religious, but someone in their family, if they happen to be walking in a path that is, er that is erring, they think that the church isolates that one aspect of their life from everything else. And the church does try to look at people fully with God's mercy. And so the, the, the world thinks that we are labeling people with these gargantuan scarlet letters, if you remember Nathaniel Hawthorne's image. And the church looks, is at least supposed to be looking at people with God's mercy. We don't hide from the sins that they commit, but God's mercy, to steal Sister Yvonne Mary's line, is greater than our misery. And so that the first thing that people see in Pope Francis is that he's looking at them with merciful love, calling them to conversion, rather than looking and saying their sins summarize all that they are. All right, thank you. I'll let you yeah, go ahead, Father. I mentioned earlier this morning the uh, recent book by the Holy Father, The Name of God is Mercy. In that book, which is an interview again with a journalist, the Holy Father is asked exactly that question. What did you mean by that? And it's very, it's very helpful and very reassuring to read his answer. He says very simply that all that he's saying there is simply his way of expressing exactly what you find in the catechism. So I'll just refer you to that. It's a very fine answer and answers a lot of these misinterpretations of what he said in 2013. All right, thank you so much, Father. Uh, sister, you first, and then you, Patrick, from uh, your standpoint. Um, sister, what's the best way? What's the best advice that you could give on getting a personal relationship with God? Best. This person wants to know what is the best, best advice you can give them on getting a personal relationship with God. I think the best way uh, to, to gain or to grow in a personal relationship with God is through his mother. Um, we all have mothers. Our, our mothers know what we need. Sometimes we may have had a mother, some of us may have had a mother that didn't, but, but mothers for the most part know. <clears throat> our Lord's mother knew, and she knows us very well, our mother of mercy. I told a story to the youth this afternoon, and it's a brief one, but I just wanted to tell you this. I had, a, I had an experience myself uh, where one of my brothers um, was suffering from alcoholism, wasn't able to recover from it over and over again in treatment programs. One day, at that time, I was living in Rome, uh, and I came home a week for a vacation, and we had a family picnic, and he was there. So we, I really get a chance to talk to him much, but um, we, you know, we exchanged just greetings and all of that. Well, I had to leave to go, and I was leaving before everyone else was. I went to my car, and my brother followed me there, and he, he said to me, uh, I'm not going to church. I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. I don't know what to do. I, I, just, I'm, I just don't know what to do. I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. So I said to him, Matt, Matt, just say one Hail Mary and you'll be all right. Just say a Hail Mary. Don't worry about all that other stuff. And so I left and he left. <clears throat> a couple weeks later, he was killed on a motorcycle accident. And so um, a, few, some, a short time after that, I received a call from one of my sisters. Now, no one knew what exchange went on between my brother and I that day. But one of my sisters called me and she said, I just have to tell you the weirdest thing. I had a dream about Matt last night, and um, he, he came to my window, and she said it was kind of weird, and I said to him, Matt, what are you doing here? And he said, Michelle, just one thing. Just say one Hail Mary, and I promise you, you'll be all right. So I learned from that, and I, I tell that story as often as I can. Go through her. A relationship with God will come through her. Through her. Thank you, sister.
Patrick, if you could also, from your perspective too, coming from a business standpoint and somebody. Okay. So I don't know that there's a business standpoint for having a personal relationship with Jesus. <laughs> um, but um, I would say cut out the middleman. Um, I would say seek him. Uh, talk to the Lord. Uh, seek him in prayer. Uh, seek him in scripture. Seek him in the sacraments. Seek him in the Eucharist. Uh, and if you seek him, you will find him. Uh, and I, I, I don't, uh, and I, by the way, cutting out the middleman was not a comment on Mary. I'm sorry. That was a menace humor. Um, uh, I, I, I think seek Christ uh, uh, with all your heart and, and, and he will come to you. And, uh, uh, and, and the last comment I would make is talk to him about the mundane. Don't just talk to him about the big things. Talk to him all the time throughout the day. Thank you. I appreciate it. Awesome. It's always a bummer. We always run out of time. So this is kind of timely. So I'd like to get into this. And if all five of you could maybe add something to this. When it comes to what we're doing right now, when it comes to voting, the question was, what is the best type of candidate to vote for in any office, considering everything that's going on right now? And it's so important. Each one of you, if you could. We don't have, we have a few minutes. So if you could, you know, give a few ideas, that would be great. Thank you. Well, since I have the mic, I'll, I'll start on that. Look for the candidate who better, no one's going to be perfect in the real situation, but look for the candidate who better than the others supports what we hold as Catholics and who is smart enough to do it well. So that, that's kind of the art of politics. The one who is best going to be able to support the most of what we hold for. There's a lot of emotion in politics, as you all know. And, but there's a lot more to truth than emotion. As a matter of fact, emotion plays just a very small part in truth. And so I think that Father Gallagher's point about, you know, we just understanding, um, about intelligently um, un understanding the issues that we're dealing with. But don't vote on emotion. Vote on knowledge and understanding. Sometimes it's a little discouraging with those who run for office. We're looking for more and we don't really get it. And so we do, at the same time that we're voting in individual elections, need to be looking long term in terms of those with the values that can influence a culture so that there'll be better candidates and better leadership along the way. And so that's got to be one of the factors. And as Cardinal Ratzinger said back in 2004 when the U.S. bishops asked, there would be certain manifestations of values so antithetical, so contrary to what we hold, that if we allow somebody to plant those weeds in our country, it's going to be very difficult to free ourselves. And so Catholics are never so much one issue voters per se, but there can be certain issues that are so foreign to what we hold that we can say somebody who's going to use his or her office to do that can never really represent me. And so I would agree with both what Father Gallagher and Sister Yvonne Mary have said before, but I would look for a candidate who, one, has values that for the most part are at least consistent, second, who's capable of implementing those, and three, who would create the right type of example so that we're able to form generations to remember the free and virtuous society so that we're able to create the conditions of the possibility for the best good coming tomorrow. Uh, uh, G.K. Chesterton has a book called What's Wrong with the World? And the very first chapter is about the failings of politicians. And two of them point at the same situation, the same symptom, and they have two different solutions on how to solve the same symptom. And the reason is because neither has the ability or the intellectual fortitude or even capacity to 
argue what the body politic ought to look like. What should our culture look like? And I would say we should pick a candidate, um, and again, I agree with everything that's already said, but is there a candidate out there who has a sense of culture and of the society that we want? And I think there are some people who point to different things and they, they have answers for how to, how to respond to them, but are they going to create a country that we want to be here in 30 years? Can they even conceive of it or speak of it? And uh, I'm fearful of some of the people who are speaking today, uh, and I, I mean this on both sides, um, who point to systems, uh, to, to symptoms and, and solutions that really ent entail changing who we are, um, you know, from a, to a socialist country to a whatever it might be. And so I would say, we need to look at all their individual traits, but also we need to say, is there anybody who's speaking with a vision of the type of society we ought to have? And there's a limited number of candidates that are doing that, and they're the ones I like. <laughs> My answer would probably be a little bit different than the other members of the panel. Um, I'm just speaking personally, not from the church, uh, but I feel that the election process that we are faced with right now is no different than Nazi Germany back in the 1930s, when they were dealing with the communists running for office, national socialists running for office, and people put a man into office who was a demagogue, who um, brought out the worst in people. And so he was one choice, and the other one seemed just as bad. I'm hopeful that a third choice will come, because as it is right now, for the two who are leading in both parties, I won't vote for either one of them, because I don't want my name to go down in history supporting either of those two people who are diametrically opposed to what we stand for as Christians. So I'm hoping for a third person. And so all I do for my people is I t tell them, pray. Pray real hard. We still have time. Pray for a person who best represents God's interest to be the main person who is running for office. And so prayer is my only answer. I liked Father's comment uh, very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, there, but one of the things I want to remind us is uh, I have a, a good friend in politics who says that we need to remember politics is the scorecard, it's not the battleground. The battleground is society and the family. And politics is going to show long term the failures that are occurring locally. And uh, we, if we want to change the outcomes, the elections, we must engage, we must be involved in politics. But that's just a, it, that's not the battleground. That's the scorecard of what's been happening locally. And then I'll give one other quote from Evelyn Waugh, who never voted ever. And they asked Evelyn Waugh, why don't you ever vote? And he said, I don't want to give them any encouragement. <laughs> and with that, can everybody give our guest a round of applause for a great day of speaking and our panel? Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for coming to the 19th Annual Lytton Symposium. Please come back next year and make the 20th the best ever. Thanks again for being here today.